Good morning. Can all of you hear me? All right. It's great to be here. Uh, as uh, Steve was introducing, I'm going to do it in one session. So I'm going to combine uh, both the presentations, which is basically a case study from the one of the states in India, uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, AP, you could call it for short. Uh, I've been involved in this program as chief architect over the past 15, 16 months or so. So what, you, what you're currently seeing is still work in progress. And I'll also share with you how things are going to pan out over the next uh, 15, 16 months. Uh, I have deliberately uh, titled my presentation from aspiration to inspiration is uh, because uh, uh, AP is the first state in India that has developed a statewide enterprise architecture. And you will, I'll go through the case study, you'll see how complex it is. Uh, and the inspiration part is because uh, many states have now uh, kind of picked it up and uh, they are talking to us uh, in terms of whether, you know, whether they could even look at a statewide enterprise architecture. So AP becomes the first state. So in this presentation, I am technically representing obviously my organization, but, you know, uh, because Mr. Satyanarana couldn't be here, I'm also representing the state government at, at a certain level. Uh, so some of the inputs have come from uh, Mr. JSAT. Uh, and the reason why... Uh, you know, why we call this e pragati is because one of the mistakes that architects do is we, uh, you know, uh, we use technical terms that people really don't understand. I mean, people sitting here would understand what is digital, what is enterprise architecture, what is, you know, what is Microsoft doing, what is Apple doing. We are not going to talk about Facebook and Apple and Google and Microsoft. It doesn't matter, right? What matters is pragati in Hindi, in Indian language, means development. It means progress. It's a tagline for the state because this is what enterprise architecture is doing for the state. You go and talk to a farmer and say, I'm going to do a statewide enterprise architecture. Nobody cares. It doesn't ring a bell anywhere, right? In this room, maybe it sounds very good, but to the real people, it doesn't mean anything at all. You know, so the entire intent of naming, you know, putting that label of Pragati was we wanted to ensure that when we go and talk to a villager, he or she knows what e pragati can do for him or her all right so what i will do is over the next 50 minutes or so uh, i will take you through the presentation and then i have a five minute short video prepared by the state government i'm going to play out so it will give you a good idea of what the whole case study is all about all right what this slide actually shows you basically the first few slides is where i set the context so this was the initial trigger, so to speak, for the state government. Uh, this is nothing specific to the case study that we are talking about. But in general, uh, in my own 15, 16 years of experience, I've been involved in many countries, not just in India, many countries around the world in terms of doing and advising on national enterprise architecture. So I'm starting to see some kind of a common pattern, right? So what governments are trying to figure out is how they move from the current generation of government, which tends to be fairly hierarchical, rigid, you know, services are typically single channel or maybe a few channels to a point where the government becomes more network, more collaborative, more flexible, where people are participating in the delivery, co-creation of the services, right? Now, we know that there is no government in the world which has actually achieved, you know, the second generation or the next generation of uh, characteristics. But most people, most governments are in transition between what you see now to what you, you know, what you're going to see over the next five, ten years. And this is what actually triggered the overall journey for uh, AP. So India has been involved in, um, you know, e-governance uh, journeys over the past uh, 30, 40 years. I'm going to show you that longitudinal slide as to how India has progressed in terms of e-governance. And that will give you a good idea of the overall evolution of how government is changing. Now, having said that, there's some certain expectations that people have from the government. One is moving from departmental stuff pipe silos to becoming more citizen centric. This is easier said than done. Uh, we all know uh, the basic idea is if as long as you don't have to go into a government office, you're better off, right? So that's the basic mental model that we still carry. And most in most of the countries, that is very common. There's nothing specific to any country. 
Uh, to make that happen, therefore, you need transforming and integration of back office operations, of the government operations. I'm not talking of IT systems alone. I'm talking of the entire operation of the government, both the legal function, the administrative function, the, ju the judiciary, so on and so forth. It requires collaborative working and information sharing. This is, again, it's a very motherhood statement, but in the government, it's very difficult for ministries and departments to share information because the, uh, you know, the, uh, I would say the standard answer when you look for collabor collaboration between ministries and departments is that the information is confidential. Right, so that's the standard answer, that's the standard excuse, right? I know that there are certain countries who have come up with open data initiatives. UK is one of the countries which has a fairly good open data initiative. In fact, we in Singapore were looking at UK at that point. Having said that, it would still be very primitive to expect ministries to share information, you know, because they still operate in the, you know, 18th and 19th century uh, mindsets. Uh, Citizens are therefore expecting product and service innovation in terms of what services the government provides, whether it's a G2C service or a G2B service or a G2G service. It doesn't matter. I mean, citizens are expecting, and I'll show you one slide later on, in terms of adoption of digital technologies, you know, comparing uh, businesses, corporate businesses, governments, and people, right? So the innovation is being expected by the people. Uh, citizens obviously are looking to be engaged and part of the entire equation. And what the people are expecting is that in addition to all of those major transformational changes, they, are do, they do expect the countries and governments to still perform well, right, in terms of economic performance and so on and so forth, right? So these are some of the key expectations that people have from the government, nothing specific to any state or country, but I think most of us would resonate. If, if you worked in the public sector ever, most of us would resonate with these points. And this is very difficult to do in the governments. And there are many reasons. Governments are complex systems, complex ecosystems, right? Now, what you would typically see in a large country is that most governments have a multi-layered structure. So you could have a government at the central level, federal level. You could have a government at the state level, followed by some kind of a provincial or a district level, and then even at the city level, right? In India and large countries where you have a multi-party democracy, each at each level, a different political party could be ruling who obviously don't like to talk to each other. Right? I'm sure getting, getting consensus in UK with a population of 65, 70 million people is hard enough. Think of a country which has a population of 1 billion. Right? So that kind of consensus is very difficult to get and that's why enterprise architecture at this level is extremely complex. Okay? I'll show you some data later on, but I think you get the point. However, having said that, you still need to understand that when the government provides service, some of these services could transcend multiple levels of government, which means you have to factor in that level of complexity because there could be a service with a mix of federal uh, rules provided by the state and delivered at the city level, for instance. So all of these complexities come in when you're dealing with government. I'm sure some of you come from very large organizations, but I can tell you, I mean, all of you would definitely agree that the government is the largest organization in any country that you can imagine. Right? Okay. Now here is a survey. Uh, so obviously you can see a few countries there. Uh, you know, you have a few countries, emerging economies, large countries like India, Brazil is there. You have small countries like Singapore. What I like to highlight, given that we are going to present a case study from India. So this is what citizens in India expect from government. They are expecting, you know, people are expecting governments do plan for the long term, not just for the next few years. This is critical because remember, in a democracy, there are elections and elections do impact every decision making. Okay? It is not Facebook or Apple or Google that impacts. It's the election that will impact the decision making. That's number one. So what people are saying is when you come up with some kind of an architecture, it should span multiple election cycles because that continuity is extremely important. Number two, understand the priorities of the citizens. So involve the citizens in the decision making. So many governments are starting to do that. The good thing is technology now allows us to do. For instance, we could easily use social media to do a sentiment analysis. Many governments do that. Okay? 
And the third one is involve the citizen in the actual decision making process itself. So in some sense, you can figure out what the people are expecting at the India level, at, at the national level, right? And uh, I leave the slides with the organizers here so you can also see what other countries look at. So as I was saying, here is a survey done by the uh, World Bank. It shows you the adoption of digital technologies comparing uh, business, corporate businesses, people, citizens at large, and governments. And you can see the graph in the center shows the adoption of digital technology by people is higher than governments and businesses at an individual level. Right, we, all, we know that, right? I'm, I'm sure each of us is probably carrying three to five digital devices at this point right now. Right, so you can imagine that there is some level of catching up that needs to be done by governments and businesses in terms of adoption of digital technology. And that make, makes a lot of things very, very complex for governments to think about. You know? So we'll, we'll get through that in the case study. So I was talking about the journey. So this is the journey that India has gone through from 19, mid 70s all the way to, uh, you know, at this point. So you can see that the initial uh, theme, so to speak, of e-governance was getting the computers into the office machine, into, into the offices, so computerization. Then slowly people realized that with computers you can become more efficient, you can bring in more automation. So that was the second generation of e-governance journey. Then the adoption of standards, you know, more output focused uh, metrics came in. Finally, at this point, you can see which is the digital India, which uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been currently advocating. And by the way, that's the world's largest digital project at this point, $70 billion is being spent, right? This is at the national level, right? So you talk of digital, that's the size. And the whole idea is getting the government to be more collaborative. We are talking of governments at the central level, ministries at the central level, at the state level, district level, city level, so on and so forth. More personalized and more outcome driven. So I'll show you some of the outcome driven metrics that we are uh, you know, using in the state of AP. So it gives you a general sense of how e-governance as a, as a whole has uh, uh, evolved, so to speak, in the last 30, 40 years in India. All right. So this is where we come in. Let's see. I hope it works. So this is where we come in. So this this was the this is the official definition that we have used in AP. Government enterprise architecture is a mission focused approach. I'll show you all of those key elements later on as I walk you through the case study and the framework to galvanize pan government ecosystem. So this is a statewide enterprise architecture by transcending boundaries, departmental and ministry boundaries for delivering services in a coordinated and efficient manner. Right? And the whole idea is to encourage the notion of connected government. Connected government is not a term that we invented. It was in the UN survey in 2008. And some of you who are familiar with the UN survey, what the United Nations does is it does a survey, a survey every two years ranking the countries in terms of their e-governance uh, maturity. And one of the key success factors for countries who have done and have efficient e-governments is because they have a good enterprise architecture, right? So all of that stuff actually comes in to the survey. So that's what we have been using as a basis for our uh, entire approach. Now, what I show you here uh, below is what are the key elements? So obviously, you know, uh, we need to understand who are the internal stakeholders, who are the external stakeholders when you're delivering enterprise architecture. What is the mission and vision? So I'll show you the mission and vision, taking a citizen-centric approach, the important point is here, these are the key capabilities that any government needs to have. And if you can see here, it actually doesn't say technology is one of the key capability. It's all about leadership. It's all about having the resources. It's all about managing the internal talent, partnering, networking, all of the soft areas, so-called soft areas. But what we have seen, I'll show you actual numbers there. What we have seen is these are the critical success factors, showstoppers. Right. It doesn't matter what technology you adopt. Okay? So, and we are going to focus on that because this is one of the key elements of success for any government enterprise architecture because one thing that we architects don't keep in mind is that we think our role is advisory. You do the blueprint, you do the design, and it's over. 
If it is not implemented, there is no ROI. Right? So the whole focus, in my view as architect, should be on adoption. If you cannot focus on adoption, don't do an architecture. All right? It's just a piece of paper which will become shelfware. So this is the definition that we used as setting up the overall initial uh, you know, uh, thought process for the state. Okay. So some of you should be, you know, the basic areas that we have developed as part of the state enterprise architecture. And what you see here are some of the terms I'm definitely sure, you know, you're familiar with that. But what we have added to this is very important from a government or a public sector perspective is having a policy and strategy architecture. Because, as I said, if you want to implement an architecture in the government level, you need supporting policies. It is not going to happen on its own. Right? That's the reason we added a roof, so to speak, on the picture. Uh, obviously, there's a business architecture, which is nothing but a culmination of uh, capabilities and processes, which I'll show you the capabilities and processes later on, which gives us an inside-out view aligned to the services and products that the government delivers and offers, which provides an outside-in view. In most cases, what you will see, and obviously the alignment is symbolic here, but in most cases what happens is a lot of people think doing business architecture only means modeling the business processes. We all understand, right? Just business processes is only the internal operational aspect of the enterprise architecture or the business architecture, right? We need to understand what services are provided by the government because services is how government interacts with the people. It doesn't matter what your processes are. That's your internal capability. Okay, so this was the overall uh, framework that we used in terms of developing the uh, e-pragati, which is the AP state. Okay, so if you don't know what we are talking about and which state we are talking about, this is a state in southern India, I would say southeastern India, so that's where you see here, right there, all right. The state itself is 160,000 square kilometers, 10 cities, 10 cities with a population greater than 1 million, districts 13, sub-districts 670, villages 12,920, population 50 million. It's about the size of a country in Europe. Okay, the state itself has grown at an average of about 15% over the last 10 years, GDP growth. So it is a high growth state. Okay. And it is a leader in e-governance as such. So obviously these things did play a role in terms of why this was the first state which thought of enterprise architecture. Okay, so that's about some information about the state and where it is placed within the overall map of India. E-Pragati. So that's the name that we have given and the whole vision is towards digital Andhra Pradesh. So E-Pragati is a new paradigm in governance based on a whole of government framework, as I said earlier, pan-government framework, transcending departmental boundaries. It adopts a mission-centric approach, so I'll show you what those missions are in design and implementation that seeks to realize the vision of Sunrise AP 2022. So the vision, I'll show you the video later on also, the vision is based on these six pillars, so to speak, of focus areas for the state, right? You can see those six pillars and that's where the mission was established. So, so the whole idea was to get the citizen engaged, to provide citizen-centric uh, you know, services, make it more collaborative, so on and so forth. So I'll elaborate on these things. But the important point here is that the state has a vision to be a developed state by UN standards by 2029. So the goal is very clearly established number one success factor for enterprise architects. Don't have ambiguous goals. You will not get anywhere. Set that goal which matters. We have meetings with the chief minister every two months. He spends one hour reviewing this project. He told us very clearly the outcome. Earlier I told you outcomes, right? The outcome of this project should be, it should improve the state's GDP. It's already growing at 15% by 2% as a result of the enterprise architecture. Right? Many times I'm sure we get asked what should be the KPI to met, you know, measure enterprise architecture. Nothing. It is basically a business KPI. If you look, if you're converting that to a corporate, uh, you know, outcome, it should be impact to the top line and bottom line. Nothing else. Everything else is detail. It doesn't matter to the leaders. How many documents you created, what model you used, what tool you used, which notation you used, irrelevant. Okay. 
Now, I was talking about the mission. So this is how it started. You can see the seven missions there. Primary, social skills, so on and so forth. Those are mission areas, focus areas. Each has four. For each of those mission areas, we have developed key performance indicators. Go through this list. It doesn't say building better IT systems as a mission, something that we architects tend to keep doing. It is all about affecting people, businesses, industries, and citizens, common people. All right, so that's established the overall focus for the enterprise architecture. We certain we established fundamental principles. I'm sure you're familiar with some of the ideas behind the principle. So the whole idea was to look at one government, look for reusability, single entry, multiple use, disintermediation, reintermediation, or e-intermediation. What that means is when you talk of at the mission level, you do not know which ministry and which a department delivers the service. It is not important. As a citizen, you don't care which department offers me the service. Because the basic philosophy of enterprise architecture, when, look, when you're looking at it from a whole of government perspective, is when a citizen approaches the government, any ministry, any department, the government or the department cannot say, sir, you came to the wrong department. There is no wrong door. Okay, so this is our view of looking at citizen-centric services. What you see on this slide and the next slide is basically the business reference model or the business architecture for the entire state. So what you see in the center are the same seven missions which I showed you earlier, but now we also have the departments, all right, who come together to provide a group of similar services. On your left, you see the different types of stakeholders, and on your right is how we have structured the business architecture, the various elements, so to speak, segments of business architecture. Now, to support this, obviously, we have the details of, we have come up with the capabilities, we have come up with the processes, so on and so forth. So, given the limitations of time, I'm not going to go into the details of that. When you see the video, you will get a few more details. Now, to support this kind of mission, which I've shown you two slides earlier, and this business architecture, now we have built the data reference model of the data architecture, which are the key areas that we focus on. Right? One of the principles of the government is to make the government data-driven, which means that, therefore, we have a formal structure of how data is defined, there are standards being used. For instance, one of the key standards that being used for metadata is the Dublin Core Standards, but an extension of the Dublin Core Standards. We have master data. Uh, earlier, somebody was saying there is no single source of truth. Yeah, this is the single source of truth. It is there, right? There is no concept of no architecture. The concept is emergent architecture. All right? We have master data. We have identified key areas of, you know, fundamental areas of data. So, for instance, data about people, data about land, data about business entities, data about things, right? IoT data hub, so on and so forth. That forms our core data. From there, we identified domain-specific data. So, for instance, you could be data-specific to healthcare domain, it could be transportation domain, it could be social services domain, it could be, you know, medical services domain, so on and so forth. Followed by analytical data from where you draw the insights. This is happening. This is not motherhood statement. You know, I'll talk about the actual projects that we have identified. Now, to support this, you obviously need application. This is our application reference model, so to speak. What you see here, which is extremely deliberate, is that we have allowed for the ministries and the agencies and the departments there to retain their autonomy. This is something, again, which has to be extremely relevant in a democratic setup. You cannot, because a lot of people think that when you're talking of enterprise architecture, you're only talking of centralization and standardization. Yes, to some extent. So what you see here in the application architecture is the way we have taken a tiered approach to standardization, right? So at the bottom, you see that there are certain application capabilities which are departmental specific because the nature of operations may be different. The way a hospital works is not the way a bus company would work. So you provide for that autonomy. 
Second level, we have identified certain applications which tend to be cross-cutting, which means multiple departments have to be involved in the end-to-end -end process, part of the approval, review, so on and so forth, and therefore you need some level of orchestration. These are cross-cutting applications. Third level, we have identified group applications. So these are applications which are specific to a group of similar ministries and departments. Right? It could be transportation, it could be healthcare, it could be judicial, so on and so forth. So groups of applications. And finally, we have common applications right on the top. These are common across the entire government. Okay, so what does it do? It provides for autonomy at the department level, at the group level, but also takes benefit of economies of scale because you have identified common capabilities across the government. No rocket science here, just thinking. To support this, we have the technology reference model, which is where we get the biggest benefits of standardization. It's a commodity, right? The physical devices, the data center is a commodity. It doesn't matter whether my laptop is a HP or a Lenovo, it's a commodity, right? So we can standardize there. So you can see the four, five reference models that we have identified, which establishes the framework, the entire framework for the uh, statewide enterprise architecture. Now, put it, to put it all together and to get the connected view is what we have here. So you can see the seven missions on top, right? We have identified the group applications. One thing on your left is the e-highway. This is the enterprise service bus where all these 72 applications, so the number of applications that we are talking about, will interact. And the entire approach that we have taken is the whole of government view. However, that does not preclude individual departments and ministries to develop their own enterprise architecture. Another thing which is very different in government but it, you know, as compared to the corporate businesses. Okay, I'll talk about that later on. Operating landscape, the earlier speaker Stuart was saying it is not an IT project, absolutely. This is the whole idea of e-pragati. So this is e-pragati in the center. It is much beyond technology. We are looking at missions, we're looking at whole of government approach, so that's the vision, government services, there are technology building blocks, objectives, we have grids, I and mean, look at the grids, we are talking of power grids, water, road, fiber, and gas. It is not just IT, IT, IT. It is technology, yes, but not IT, IT. Because the state wants to use enterprise architecture as a means to achieve digital government. All right. Now we have identified 72 initiatives shown here, which are prioritized by waves. So we have wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, and a few standalone projects. Wave one is called wave one because these are the projects that need to be done. These are the initiatives that need to be done first because these are the foundational things that need to be done for other things to work. Right. So the wave one is wave one because it is definitely in sequence wave one. Right. That's the first thing to do. The interesting thing is there are 72 different projects here. Now, a lot of people tell us, what do you do with enterprise architecture coming in and telling us? Now, of the 72, about 44 are new initiatives and about 27 are existing initiatives. So it's a mix of new initiatives and enhancement of existing initiatives. Okay, so that's another thing. We, uh, I think all of you know that as enterprise architects, we would never work in a greenfield environment, right? Unless you're in a startup. So this is how it looks. 14 departments, 745 services, 14 packages, 72 projects. So in the previous slide, I showed you those projects and packages. The total implementation budget is $350 million spent over the next two years. The impact is 50 million people. That's the population of the state. Where are we? As of yesterday, 24 RFPs have been issued. It's a public RFP. We have all the major companies in the world responding to those RFPs. 14 RFPs are ready to be issued, so it will be issued by the end of May. Uh, some of them are already going on, so 12 systems, 12 you know, initiatives are already being implemented, and there are a few things which are in initial stages, like 14, and some are in progress. It gives you a general sense of where we are vis-a-vis -vis those 72 different initiatives. 
and what are the challenges are that we are facing in terms of implementation it is not a you know silver bullet all through capacity building government officers don't understand what enterprise architecture is neither do they care okay we may all sit in this room and assume that people are all going hunky dory about enterprise architecture nobody is so you have to change your vocabulary all right defining requirements is extremely important because as i said government officers have never heard about this term enterprise architecture but when you present it in a proper way one of the key things that we are looking at is building capacity at the grassroots level program management managing 72 different initiatives is not easy it requires a massive uh, program management capability so we have set up a office of architecture i'll talk about that later on and aggressive timelines two years is the timeline because in two and a half years the state will go through an election i told you right political cycles do play a role in terms of your deciding you know cycles all right it gives you a general idea of what e pragati is all about i think the benefits are fairly you know easily understandable i'll just you know list out all of them okay so there are benefits both for the state departments and of course citizens and businesses okay so people ask me why does it work in ap you know other states and other countries so brazil is interested you know being a similar country emerging country why does it work i'll tell you what are the five critical success factors so that's the approach that the state government uses there's a strategic planning um, obviously there's a budgeting policy performance management program management so on and so forth but the five key things that really stand out is number one having a clear vision and purpose okay so the goal of the state is very clear you will see in the video by 2029 by 2022 top 3 states in india and by 2029 a developed state number 2 mission you i've shown you the mission and sdg is the sustainable development goals as defined by the united nations so we are using that to establish our kpis so to speak the outcome centric kpis number 3 is of course the thinking process which is where architecture comes in so once you have the vision and once you have the goals very clear establish that part the thinking process is very important the planning and the thinking you know obviously it needs to be followed through with execution but i think that's an important part of the overall story funding and resources no free lunch the state has um, approved the budget that i showed you earlier so the numbers are to be shared there's no public confidential information here right and finally it is being driven by the chief minister himself okay that makes a lot of difference in the overall traction and overall buy in that you get from the lawmakers other lawmakers and bureaucrats all right so in our view what i have seen over the past 15 16 months these are the five critical success factors that any government you know doesn't matter whether it's india or any other country any government in the world needs to keep in view when they are looking at a state wide or a government wide whole of government enterprise architecture what does this mean this is what it means so the department centric services the department will not go away they are going to be around however what is important is that we are that's why i use the word disintermediation now this is scary because suddenly i've done that presentation to many joint directors and senior directors in the departments right basically the ceos of the department and this is scary for them because suddenly they say the departments are no longer the critical areas okay it's almost like you are there but you are implicit not explicit and people say where is my department i said it doesn't matter to the citizens where your department is that's your internal telephone directory go through it okay having said that what is important is that the departments are not going away anywhere it's just that a little bit of restructuring another important aspect of enterprise architecture if you do enterprise architecture in the real sense it does lead to restructuring 
Okay, that doesn't mean that the departments or the current org structure is going away anywhere, but the way you design your services and part of your business capabilities, it needs to be overlaid on top of the basic administrative structure that the governments have or any kind of organization has. Okay, therefore, to make this happen, we established a strong governance structure. As you can see, it is headed by the chief minister himself right on top and followed by a group of senior bureaucrats and other lawmakers, right? There are ministers involved in reviewing specific areas that, you know, uh, you know that basically is their focus area. This is the overall governance structure that we have uh, established and this continues to remain. And obviously you have project teams and you have IT procurement department, you have other government departments, so on and so forth. All right, earlier I was telling you why countries have done well in certain e-government programs. That's because what you see on your left are the maturity stages as defined by the United Nations, right? On top is the maturity of your architecture. And the message from this slide is very simple. If a government, whether it's a state government or a national government, wants to improve its e-government maturity, because that's what AP wants to do, you have to have uh, you know, mature architecture. One of the things that you see here is w once you reach that connected government level, which is, if you remember, is the vision of the state government is government appears and operates as one. There's high degree of integration needs between common shared business functions and outcomes. And what it provides us is the line of sight, right? The ability to address some of these questions. Okay, that's fine. Integration. So, Whenever I make this presentation, especially this slide, to the ministries and departments, one thing I talk about is for you to succeed, one of the, th see, I think as architects, we understand all of this stuff. This is the easy stuff. For you to succeed, you need political and legal integration. In many cases, we know that the technology, for instance, in many countries, digital signature is not taken as an approved author authorized signature by the courts. So while the technology is available, the legal guys are still playing catch up. Right, so as I said, for any country, if you don't have the political and legal integration, if the ministers don't decide that let's collaborate and let's look at it holistically, it's not going to happen. Okay, we can all beat our heads and say, oh, this is the framework, that's the notation we use. As I said, they are irrelevant in most cases. It doesn't matter to them. Okay, what are we trying to achieve through the e-pragati is a 360 degree view. We are trying to get vertical line of sight, top to bottom. We are trying to get horizontal line of sight, left to right. We are trying to get across, lateral line of sight. Because it's possible that one of the services that hits a mission area in, let's say, a health sector can also talk to another, uh, you know, uh, data level entity in the education sector. All right, so this is what we are trying to achieve through ePragati and all those 72 projects that we, I spoke about earlier. Okay, now, I know we, have, we are in an open group conference, so it's important for us to say how TOGAF works, right? And what did we do with TOGAF? Remember that I told you governments are multi-layered organizations, right? I showed you four levels that exist in India. I think most countries will have multi-level organization, which means you have to extend TOGAF to make it work in that kind of governance structure, right? So this is what shows you, right? So at the whole of government level, obviously there is a vision and mission, which I showed you. You need to have a whole of government strategic architecture, which is where you define the methodology, the framework, the reference models, so on and so forth. However, you also have to allow for autonomy at the ministry or department level, which is called the agency enterprise architecture. By doing e-pragati for the state of AP, as I said, it does not exclude the individual ministries. Tomorrow, the Ministry of Health can come and say, can, come and say, can I do my own enterprise architecture? By all means, you should be able to do it. However, the important point is it should be aligned to the overall statewide architecture. So the layering is built into the approach that we are using in AP. With respect to ADM, this is how it would work. You're familiar with ADM, right? All of you, I'm assuming what A to H means. So this is the whole of government level. You go through one cycle to establish the reference architectures, which is what I walked you through today. However, this provides an input 
to form the repository or the archive to form the next level of journey, the same ADM but in the next cycle. So if a ministry or agency wants to again adopt TOGAF, it can do so. So you see the top, the, the, the input is coming from the previous slide, from the whole of government reference architecture, but the individual agencies still have to do their own enterprise architecture. Now, if you want to come up with solutions and systems, this is how it looks like. So you can see all of the phases, TOGAF ADM phases, and the key you know, milestones, so to speak, in the solution architecture model. And the third level is the agency is developing its own solution architecture. So you're moving from enterprise, whole of government enterprise architecture to agency or ministry enterprise architecture to the solution level architecture. And how does all of these things work? This is what we are using in AP. So you have the whole of government architecture, there's a segment or individual architecture. There's a repository. The important point is what the individual ministries and departments do does become part of the repository, which can be used by other ministries. Okay, so this is how we have extended, so to speak, TOGAF to ensure that it works in a multi-level scenario. Why is it important? Because the Indian team here, you know, uh, Open Group Team in India is is aware of it, we are not talking of doing enterprise architecture for the entire country at the national level. So these issues will come up. What are the goals? Five Ps, we call it five Ps of e-pragati. We are ensuring that the services are people-centered, the government becomes proactive, predictive, a lot of data is there, participative and partnership-based. There is no need for government to deliver all of the services by itself. You could always have, I'll, you know, you'll see that in the video, of the 72 projects, at least a third of them are going to be delivered and you know, implemented on a PPP basis. It is not necessary for government to do everything because the important point is that one of the big thing, learning points from a large mega enterprise architecture initiative is that you have to think of the funding model. Okay, as architects, you might say, no, that's not my, you know, that, that's where the finance guys will come in. No, you have to think of the funding model because this is what the governments are going to ask of you. Okay, I think in general, I walked through the case study. Right, e pragati is more a reform process of the government sector for a future ready government rather than mere streamlining of the government ICT structure. I think I've kind of alluded to that already. People ask me, Obviously, there is a success story here, but has it been easy? No, it's not easy because there are factors which make it very complex. And I've kind of summarized them into six bullets. I'll walk you through those bullets. So top, top six factors that make VUCA. You know what VUCA is? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, right? Earlier, somebody was saying no architecture. No, there is architecture. Enterprise architecture by definition is different. Organizations are volatile, they are ambiguous, they are complex, they are uncertain. You have to deal with that. I'll tell you why it is more important when you're talking of an India-centric progress approach. Already mentioned this, India is a multi-party democracy where diversity is a fact of life. You have to deal with diversity. You cannot come and tell everything needs to be standardized, everything needs to be centralized. It will not work, it will be rejected. States demand and expect autonomy in the overall federated structure. So the way we have in terms of our you know, constitutional structure, states do have a lot of autonomy. Even though there is a central government, the decision is typically through consensus. And sometimes it's chaotic, as we all know. States are country-sized. I've given you some data. And at the national level, which we are talking of at this point, the potential is to impact one point. 25 billion people. Architects like to do things large, right? This is as large as it gets. Digital divide coexists with urban, rural, and linguistic divides. It's a reality in India. We have to deal with this. Right? You go to a rural area who's you know talking to a farmer, um, he has probably never used a computer before. Lawmakers and bureaucrats have different motivations. 
I told you, election is an important element. They really don't care about enterprise architecture, so it's important the way you communicate, the important is important the way you advocate the benefits at different levels. Your audience is not going to be a bunch of architects who understand the subject. Okay? And the important thing about, specifically I've seen in India, having worked in many countries, is that you go and tell, yeah, South Korea has done this, Singapore has done that. A Singapore is just a small tiny dot on the map. What happens, what works in Singapore will not work in India. Right? So the examples from other countries are not convincing enough. And last one, I've already alluded to this, political cycle, elections are a major factor in planning and delivery. So that's VUCA. And all of a culmination of all of these factors brings in these four characteristics. Therefore, people ask me what should we do? And as I said, you can come up with all the reference models, beautiful pictures, great notations. At the end of the day, you have to focus on adoption. So the state is setting up an office of architecture. Number one, it's an org structure that has been established. We are doing pilot projects to try out with senior leadership oversight. When I say leadership oversight, these are lawmakers and bureaucrats, CEOs of different ministries and departments. We are doing industry consultative sessions. It is not just Wipro, but there are many other organizations who are involved in the overall ecosystem. Clarity in ownership and accountability. Right? Service level agreements. So these are alignment processes, rotation of key personnel between teams. You know, where you come from the data architecture team, you go to the application architecture, so on and so forth. Continual capability building with methods and tools. So that's important. We are now training 500 bureaucrats on this topic of enterprise architecture. So these are ground level bureaucrats. These are people who deal with people on a day to day basis, citizens. Okay, and few other things. Success stories, multiple channels of dissemination, communities of practice, and important point that the state has done very well is we are getting greater involvement from the academia because that becomes part of the equation. Sometimes, you know, as you know, bureaucrats are trained. So if, if they have heard of this phrase called enterprise architecture somewhere, chances are that they are more receptive to that idea. Okay, I hope it gives you a general idea. That's my last slide before I show you the video. And I would obviously like to thank Mr. Satyanarayana for providing me some of the inputs. All right, so he's been a champion from the state government side, uh, and he's been a great uh, supporter of TOGAF and the open group also. I think there are a few people who would definitely agree to that. All right, shall I play the video? Is that fine? Okay. Pradesh is undoubtedly a trailblazer and frontrunner of the Indian IT sector. The government of Andhra Pradesh's singular aim to actualize Sunrise Andhra Pradesh will catapult it into the realm of the best. For making the Sunrise Andhra Pradesh vision a reality, the government of Andhra Pradesh in association with Wipro Limited has embarked upon Andhra Pradesh State Enterprise Architecture. Now called e -Pragati. APS e Pragati is the country's first statewide enterprise architecture initiative. It will drive public sector transformation and will help realize the dream of a one government that is fully oriented towards improving the quality of life of its citizens. E Pragati focuses on guiding and accelerating AP's journey to that of a transformed government. It enables collaboration among departments to deliver personalized services, which will lead to an accountable, outcome-driven government. Elevating the effectiveness and quality of government services is not merely a matter of deploying leading-edge technologies. 
It demands visionary leadership, strategic wisdom, foresight, clear direction and sound execution mechanisms. Connected governments have deeper engagement, encourage participation and collaboration and exhibit greater openness and transparency. As a result, they can deliver services that are more personalized and choice-based, being anchored in the whole of government paradigm. Enterprise architecture framework is used to ensure the IT infrastructure and services are always in sync. This leads to better implementation of goals. Pragati places special emphasis upon the agricultural sector. This will bring back the lost sheen of agriculture and its allied activities, rendering them profitable once more. Apart from the agriculture sector, e Pragati also strives to provide a wide range of services to citizens, business entities, and employees. The agricultural marketplace is also undergoing a sea change. eMundi provides facilities for online sale and purchase of agricultural commodities. Certificate-less governance is a revolutionary idea with the goal to make all government-related ideas electronic and accessible in real time. E-learning makes access to the curriculum of top universities easy for students anytime, anywhere. Quality education is now just a click away. The e-highway is envisaged as a passageway of information between consumers and provider applications across the entire government. The entire government of Andhra Pradesh is putting its might behind making e-pragati a reality sooner rather than later. Welcome to a citizen-centric, connected government. Welcome to Sunrise Andhra Pradesh, the new land of opportunities. All right, with that, uh, I'm through with my presentation. Do we on time? And I told you it was interesting, didn't I? Um, one of the things that, that always strikes me about uh, uh, whenever I hear about programs like this or in, in India is the sheer volume involved, the numbers involved of people. I remember hearing about a, um, an e-passport project with a, I think the pilot sample was half a million people for, for this project. Um, how do you go about um, getting to the vision. I mean, the idea that there's no wrong door for a citizen to go to is so alien to just about all of us in our experiences with government, wherever it may be in the world, and major companies too. Mm. How do you go about getting to that vision? Where does that come from? So in, in case of Andhra Pradesh, the good thing was because the leadership was involved right from the beginning. So I'm talking of the chief minister and the, his council of ministers and the senior bureaucrats. Uh, it was easier for them to establish the vision. Uh, one thing that the state government did is what is that they do a two year every two years they do a smart pulse survey to understand what the people want. Mm. So it was a culmination of inputs coming in from the people, which was taken and factored in, in establishing that vision for the for the state government. So the interesting thing here is the vision was for the state government. Government. It was not for enterprise architecture per se. 
enterprise or architecture as a way, the means to achieve that vision. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the people were absolutely you know, they were part of that, and the survey happens every two years, so the next one is due very soon. Right. Okay. Well, I know I'm sure we have some questions from the audience. Asking them will be somebody you know well. Uh, yeah, James yeah. Deray is of our <laughs> vice president and uh, general manager in yeah. India for the Open Group. Thank you, Palab. That was uh, um, inspirational as, as, as usual and when I hear you speak. Um, and I think flowing directly from what, what you were just talking about, um, first question is, how has the citizen, the stakeholder, been involved? Yeah, so that's why I said, right? Uh, so there is a survey being done every two years. So that's the uh, that's the Smart Pulse survey where the citizen feedback is connect, uh, you know, collected on a very regular basis. Uh, in a day-to-day -day basis, what happens is, for instance, when my team goes, uh, goes, you know, goes and meets the departments, the, the key thing is the department officials actually engage with the citizens and include us in, as part of the process. So on an ongoing basis, there is uh, you know, involvement from the citizen, plus there's a formal survey which is happening every two years. And that survey goes out to the villages? And the absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, um, in some of the villages, as I said, you know, the people may not have seen a computer or they may have just gone to a government kiosk. So the state government has distributed something like 80,000 tabs to government officials, grassroots people who go and collect data and then upload that data to the central database. So here's one here. How does the enterprise architecture ensure that it lives across the uh, changes of government through the political? Yeah, so we are, so the important point here is that the state government is definitely trying to involve the uh, other political parties as part of the decision making process. That's obviously a given there. Uh, so that would, in my view, would ensure that this would transcend, you know, uh, elections, so to speak. Yes. How many people are involved in the project on the business side and the IT side? Oh, uh, from the government side, if you ask me, the core team size is uh, at any point lot, not less than a dozen, right? So these are senior. I showed you the governance structure, right? So those people are involved at different stages. But at a working group level from the government side, which is the business side, so to speak, is definitely not less than 10. But then there is al already an extended team. So as and when there is a requirement, you go to a department, understand what their processes are, interact with the citizens. So for instance, to give you an example, we were talking to the police department and the inspector general of police said, let's go to a place where crime happens. So you guys can see how crime actually happens. And our team was, you know, understandably so was a little scared. They said, the, the IGP actually said, I'll send you escort, send you with escort. So don't worry about it. So yes, it does happen, right? But there is direct involvement from the state departments, from all the 34 departments that the state has on a day-to-day -day basis. And how many on the IT side? On the IT side, the team is almost similar. So there is an IT department, another 8 to 10 on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And then there's all the subcontractors who are doing... Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So those are additional. Yes. Essentially countless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or uncountable. Yeah. Right. How difficult was it to create the single point of contact for the citizens? Um, did you have to create a new team to implement that? Or is Pardon me? That? Creating? How, how is, the question is, how difficult was it to create the single point of contact for the citizen? Did for you the create citizen? something new to provide that single point of contact, or are you transforming all of the portals to become single points of contact? No, all, so what happens is every department has a nodal officer who, uh, who becomes the, you know, the single point of contact. The good thing was that structure already existed before this program started. So we just leveraged on that structure already. So for, for the citizens? Yes, I think yeah, the question for the is citizens. About, so the citizens window? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You talked about um, data-driven government. Um, can you give us some input on what principles should be followed in making that data open and available to enterprises and to the public? So the state government as such is not looking to open data in that sense yet because the important point for government data is that uh, earlier somebody was talking about data scientists. Uh, in most cases what you will see is in developing countries data does not exist in a form that is analyzable. First that cleaning has to take place, that transformation has to take place which is what is happening in, uh, in uh, Andhra. Uh, having said that, the other thing which is on record, you may have heard uh, Jay Satinarana in Hyderabad, is that the, the other part is the state is definitely not looking to monetize the data it has. At least that's not its goal, given goal. It will at some point make available the data, open data, so that it can encourage SMEs to deliver and design and deliver services using government data. But 
uh, that is probably the second generation. It is in the pipeline, but not yet in the formal sense yet there. And has this approach, the architected approach, enabled access to any development bank funding, World, World Bank funding or similar? Bank funding, yes. as in? World, the World Development Bank or similar funding, aid funding. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't see that as a, as a showstopper, but uh, because I think uh, what the state government is doing is it is also looking to, you know, talk to the central government, uh, you know, looking to fund some of the projects, because the interesting thing is some of these initiatives and projects can be very well applied to other states. So there are, you know, 28 other states in India who could also look at that. So the World Bank funding and the central funding will come in at some point. Um, Jay Satinarana is on record. He is talking to the Planning Commission of India. And to me, that's a very important point because a lot of people think that when you're talking of enterprise architecture, just limit yourself to the Ministry of IT or Department of IT. He's talking to the people who actually do the five-year plans for the country. I mean, this is the plan for the country itself, not for the IT part of it. And so the interaction is going on. And uh, as you know, yourself and a few others here may be aware, uh, the, the Department of Information Technology has taken note of this project and now there is something being going to be done even at the national level. So we'll see how that pans out. But the sizes are humongous. So there, there is no example for us to follow. We just have to you know, discover as we go along. And, and, and one from me, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that as we go through that description of, of e pragati and what the state of AP is doing, as you've as you just mentioned, it has applicability to other states, yes. all the different levels of development, different stages in their progress. Um, there's clearly uh, building blocks, ideas, principles that are reusable across other states within India, but also within other governments throughout the world. Um, so are there any ideas or plans to make some of this material um, publicly available, possibly through the open group or maybe through other, uh, other means. Uh, yes. So, so one thing which I can confidently say is that the state government, both the chief minister, honorable chief minister and the senior bureaucrats are very open to sharing the learnings from the state, not, to, not just to other states, but even other countries around the world. So if there is a scope for us to document some of this, let's say as an open group white paper, you know, some best practices, the state would be very happy to provide information and we would be more than happy to do that. In fact, you know, there has been some conversation around that because as James was saying, many countries even would be interested to learn about what, what has been happening and you know, what are the things to avoid, so to speak. We will talk further. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So there is a lot of scope to do that, yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Palab, for thank your you, uh, presentation.